asked. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining today's ELISA seminar on improved system stressing with Stress NG. We're very delighted to have uh, Colin King um, to uh, give us this talk. And Colin is a principal engineer at Intel. And uh, he's been working on Stress NG for quite a long time. So definitely the expert on the topic. And uh, with that, I'll pass the baton to you, Colin. Thank you very much. And um, welcome, everybody. Uh, kind of good morning, afternoon or evening, depending where you are um, in your time zone. Um, uh, as I said, my name is Colin King, and I I am basically the main developer of Stress and G. Um, I've been working on this now for over 10 years. And the last time I did a talk for Elisa was about two years ago. So this is more of an update just to tell you what's new and what's coming along the pipeline. So um, before I go any further, I'd just like to say I work for Intel, but none of this content is um, uh, related to my work at Intel. So um, yeah, this is this is a side project I work on, and um, yeah, it's not, it's not related to any Intel specific work I do. So okay, so the first question is why do we need to do stress testing? And, and I'm pretty sure that you've got systems out there which you want to know if it's resilient before you send it out into the field. So Stress and G is a tool which can find uh, ways to break kernels or software. So it can induce kernel panics, races and lock lockups and further issues like that. Um, it's really designed to see if your system behaves well under stress. So allocating lots of memory, so modes of failure, um, what happens when you run low on memory? What happens if your disk fills up? What happens if you've got too many processes running? Uh, things of that case. So basically, corner cases where you are overloading the system and to force out bugs in software and it, such as the kernel and maybe user space or daemons and so forth. Um, so another thing you can use for stress testing is to see if systems scale well. Um, you know, nowadays machines don't have just one or two CPUs. You can have um, massive systems in the server space with hundreds of CPUs. So Stress and T um, also exercises kernels to see how, oh, and software to see how well it scales. And um, we've been doing a lot, I've been doing a lot of work on that to see how well things scale on, on, on rather large systems of the last year or so. And another good idea of stress testing is, um, can we burn the system in? Can we hammer the CPU, disk, and memory and see if, see if we can force out errors? And usually um, systems, when they're new, they either fail very early on or they fail later in life. So Stress and G is a good way of taking new kit uh, or taking kit existing hardware, running a load of tests on it, and making sure it's okay before you deploy it, deploy the hardware. So why use Stress and G? Well, Stress and G has been developed over the last 10 years or so. And um, that my name was to stress systems, and it's already found over 80 kernel bugs. Uh, that's on both Linux and different BSD systems. Um, so you'll see later on that stress and G is very portable. Um, so it's good at finding bugs in lots of different systems other than Linux, but stress and G has been designed mainly for Linux and POSIX um, based systems. Uh, stress and G is used for zero day performance testing to see uh, how well. Um, kernels behave. It's got a um, BOGO ops metric, which allows one to count the number of loops around stress tests. And you know if that decreases, then your performance has reduced. And it's been used for zero day for catching um, performance regressions in the kernel. Stress and G is also used by um, numerous silicon vendors. So um, with new silicon and putting a new kernel on new silicon, it's been used. I know people in the um, RISC-V world are using it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of proven to find particular kernel bugs on new systems. Uh, stress T is also used um, by various distro folk for turning um, testing their new kernels. So whenever a kernel is patched uh, with um, stable updates or maybe um, you know, particular fixes which are pertinent to the distro's own kernel configs, Stress and G can be used to do kernel regression testing to force out bugs. 
Uh, stress and T is also a part of the LKP, LKP test suite. And so it's kind of a recognized tool in that space. And the final thing to, to notice is, is um, stress and T is actually being used by a lot of our researchers for a synthetic stress test tool. Um, it's, it's useful for generating loads and lots of people have been using it for things like stressing uh, cloud environments or server space to see how power and performance works as well as just general load testing to force out bugs. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been used a lot in totally lots of different spaces. So stress energy in 2024, where are we now? Well, quite a lot of work's been going on in the last two years to add more stress cases to cover a lot more uh, of the kernel and processor space. And we currently we've, um, have over 340 stressors. And these um, can stress the CPU in many different ways, thermal, interrupts, hash, interop, integer, floating point operations, atomic operations, register ops, floating point, bit shifting operations, uh, random number generators, and so forth. We also had um, folks from Fedora provide us a GPU stressor, which is uh, really useful. And to complement the um, CPU side of stressing, we've also got kernel side stressing. And the idea of stressing G here is to basically stress um, all the system cores and all external interfaces. So you see um, SysFS, ProcFS covered, various ARC tools, um, file system activity, signal handling, inter-process communications such as semaphores, mutexes, and um, also we've got a lot of a uh, lot of stresses to exercise the scheduler and process handling. The other thing to note is uh, stress and G also exercises virtual memory in two different ways. It exercises the way virtual memory is set up with lots of page type stresses, which do remapping, allocation, memory unmapping, mapping, and all sorts of operations like that as well as stress, stress tests, which exercise every bit in a mapping to allow you to check for broken memory and force out memory issues. So there's a lot of scope, lots of things it covers, and I will not go into too much detail of what it currently does because with 340 stresses, this will take a long time. So I, I advise you to read the manual at that point just to see how much it covers. So what have we done in the last two years? Well, I've added 50 more stresses um, and these cover a huge range of things. Um, each stress test, um, each stressor has uh, various options to allow you to set up control of the stress case, such as setting memory sizes or the number of threads to run in a stress test. So I've added more stressor options to, to allow finer control. Um, that way you don't have to use the defaults. Generally, the defaults for each stressor are quite sane, but I've added more finer control now. I've also added long 64 arch support. So uh, this was actually relatively easy, but it's a new and upcoming ar architecture and it seems pertinent to add various tests for this. Uh, also performance optimizations using Intel VTune and Perf. I've spent a lot of time over the last year just looking at various stress cases, seeing where they're um, not scaling correctly on large systems and also seeing where they're not running efficiently and hand tuning the code. So you'll find that running a new version of Stress NG compared to one two years ago, you'll see more BOGO ops per second being exercised, uh, being run, getting more throughput and more exercising on the CPU. And, and, and also there are things like cache efficiency changes I've made as well. So it's faster as well, and it's better in that case. And as I said, uh, I've been working on larger systems, so I've improved the way the scaling works. So now you can have hundreds of CPUs run on large NUMA systems, and most of the stresses now seem to scale pretty well linearly as you add more load. So that's the name of the game. I'm trying to make it exercise um, the system and find kernel issues and regressions where um, things don't scale properly and trying to help fix those in the kernel and also make stress and D work better in that case. So also I've added a lot more uh, not, um, libc and libmass coverage. So originally stress G was intended to exercise just the kernel and system calls. 
but um, it seems useful to also exercise a lot more of the libc functions and the maths functions as well. And what's been interesting here is, um, and I've ran this on, I think, NetBSD, we found a bug in the syncos function in libm. So this has been fruitful already that we found some regressions and some issues with various libraries. As time progresses, uh, um, kernels add more system calls. So I track those and I've been adding those to stress and G. The latest one is MSIL, which has landed in the Linux 6.10. And I've added a stress test for that. So I'm constantly keeping track of what's new from the kernel space and adding those stress tests into stress and G. And finally, I've also been working on improving how portable stress and G is. So I now support seven different C compilers. Um, various operating systems from Linux through various BSD systems, Solaris, uh, Minix, and, so, and, and quite a lot more. So basically, if you've got a POSIX-based operating system and you've got a libc and a, a suitable libc, uh, suitable C compiler, you should be able to port and run Stress and G on, on that system. And as I said, architectures, I've been trying to make Stress and G work better across lots of different architectures. Some of the tests are x86 specific, but I'm trying to um, use similar functionality on different architectures where possible. And also working on different kernels. Um, I've been working on stress and T for the latest kernels, but I also make it make sure it works correctly on ancient kernels from 3.4 upwards. So some of these kernels are ancient and not used, but I try and make sure that stress and T works on a whole range of kernels and you know, to make it portable and work correctly. So not just only stressors, but we've also got new control options. So when you run a stressor, uh, sometimes we run out of memory, which is not good. For example, like the brake stressor just keeps on allocating space by expanding the brake region. And eventually you run out of memory and that stressor is killed by the outer memory killer. So I've added a couple of options, Uber Void, which proactively measures how much free memory there is and will back off, stop, or even restart a stressor if we run out of memory. So that's useful when people run multiple instances of memory hogging stressors. We can use the Uber Void to try at the very best to monitor low memory and back off on that. Uh, there's also an option which, which goes for that called Uber Void Bytes. And you can specify how much memory you want as a buffer before the um killer starts, uh, um avoider starts working. And the default is about two and a half percent of free memory. So once you get less than two and a half percent, um avoid starts working to stop the out of memory um, killing. But you can adjust that with this option. You can specify the number of bytes. So you can say, like, I want 10 megabytes. You put 10 megabytes as an option. Or you can specify percentages. So you could say, like, 10%. Uh, one other um, thing is people run stresses. Um, you can run hundreds of stresses with stress ng now. So there's a status option, which will show you how many processes have been run, how many exited, and how many have been um, successfully reaped. And the status option allows you to see this activity. This is useful if you, say, do a long run and you've got, say, 100 stresses or more, and you want to see if anything locks up or if you want to see how things are progressing. So the status option, say status one, it will every one second show you the current running activity of all the stresses. So that's kind of useful. One, one more, one more um, option, well, two options here, is the permute and with options. These allow you to specify a bunch of stressors and to actually run those, with, to permute those in a run. So from my first example here, we've got stress ng with CPU matrix, vec math, and FP, floating point stressors, and the permute five basically says, run permutations of all of those stressors, um, run five instances of each of the stressors, and run each permutation for 10 seconds. So first of all, it will start off with CPU stressor, 
run five instances of that and run it for 10 seconds. Then it will run the CPU and matrix stressor together. Again, five instances of each for 10 seconds. And then one instance of the, the well, basically keep on going for every permutation. <laughs> so this can take a long time to run, but it's useful if you've got um, various stress cases which you want to run various mixes of over a long time. Uh, this has actually been helpful in um, being able to pull together various stresses, such as virtual memory stresses, put them all together with the WIV option, run the permute, and run it for several hours, and it will just tr um, trundle through every permutation and hammer the system in lots of different various mixes. Uh, another example of the WIV option, again, is I've got uh, run with the VM mem map break and memory map stresses and run all of those together eight instances of each of those stressors and run for 10 minutes so you can see the with allows you to specify a handful of stresses you want to run and the all says run them all together so the with and all and the with and permute options are really handy for running mixes of stressors and the other thing is when you're running all these together the progress option can be used and that will show you how long we've been running for and how long we've got to run to the completion. So it will tell you percentage uh, run up to completion and an estimate of when it will complete. So that's another useful option. Just if you run to run something for a long time, you can get a feel for when it will complete and see how it's going. Right, so I'll be talking about stresses. This give you very quick idea of what a stressor is. I'm not sure folk have seen this before, but I just want to give you a quick overhead. A stressor is basically a process which is forked off from stress and G. Um, so each stressor has an initialization phase where it can set things up ready for the stress test. Then it has a stress phase where basically it sits in a while loop, checks if uh, a flag is set by calling stress continue. And if that's true, it just keep on spinning in this loop until stress continues for. So basically it spins around until the stressor is signaled or stopped in some way. The stressor will run some work, and at the end of a work loop, it will increment the BOGO ops counter. And the BOGO ops is basically the meaningless metric of uh, activity. It's just a, a way of measuring how many times you've been around a, a while loop. Um, so once it's done that, there's a cleanup phase. So a stressor is actually very simple in concept. A stressor can be, um, it, I mean, in this example, it's just one little process, but in the init phase, you can actually create lots of child processes or P threads and run multiple workers concurrently, and then they all join together in the cleanup phase. And basically the raw loop runs until we get a SIG alarm, or we've hit the num maximum number of BOGO ops, or you've hit SIG kill or SIG term. So it's a very simple thing. So let's talk about the new stressors. Uh, I don't want to um, spend too much time on each individual one. I just want to give you a flavor of what's new in different categories. So we had a request for stress and G to exercise CPUs um, in terms of do various um, integer floating point type of operations fail after being um, repeated many millions of times. So I've added, um, with the use of the GNU multi -precision, precision library and the GNU MPFR library, various huge integer and huge floating point number stressors. So we've got a factorization stressor, which will factorize, who's, uh, factorize huge integers. Um, we've got an, a, a FMA, a suffuse multiply add instruction stressor. We've got a FP floating point stressor, which will stress various floating point formats from um, basic float, double, long double, and all sorts of doubles or floating point formats, such as float 80 and uh, float 64, depending on what your processor supports and your compiler supports. Um, I added a fractal um, stressor, which basically just generates fractals, very simple Mandelbrot and Julia set fractal generator but um, this spawns the computation out across multiple threads. So it's really good at exercising multiple uh, compute across a large system. 
Uh, I've also exercised um, floating point, large floating point numbers with the MPFR stressor. Um, prime number searches as well. And finally, rotate. This is a very simple one, but it basically left and right rotates various size integers. And that compiles down to normally uh, just a rotation instruction in the processor. But it's useful for capturing any bit errors when you hammer the processor for hours and on it on end. Um, as I said earlier, um, I've been wanting to exercise the maths library. So I've added various maths library stressors, such as the bezel math functions, exponential log, the power functions, and trig functions. Um, I've also exercised various random number generator functions uh, with the Monte Carlo stressor as well. Um, and the Eigen C++ matrix library, I've added an Eigen stressor um, just to exercise Eigen and the kind of methods it's calling there. And that's a really heavy load generator because it exercises both um, floating point instructions and cache and memory. Also, um, machines nowadays support vector operations. So I've added a vector floating point stressor and a vector data shuffling stressor. And these optimize really well for x86. Um, but I also know that they well uh, they, they optimize well with um, various compilers on other operation, uh, other processes. So, you know, the world is going to use vectors. So th these exercise various vector operations. And new in the world are um, obviously we have AI coming along. So I've added some vector neural network instructions using the x86 BNNI um, opcodes. But this code also has generic uh, code written for it. So it will compile for any architecture. It just won't perform so fast. But it's, it's just a useful test case, really, for exercising processes with VNNI support. The uh, version of stress and we had two years ago had excellent support for memory stressing. So I haven't really added too much here. I've added two more sort algorithms, which are fairly basic, but they're useful for uh, exercising memory and cache, especially when you use large sizes. And, um, you know, all, all these have verification enabled. So where there's problems with uh, your memory, hopefully these sort algorithms can um, show up where those problems are so that you know they're, they're just very simple sort algorithms exercising memory in a very simple way but it's a useful test i've added a memmap file stressor which tries to map nearly half a million files this is a this is quite quite a quite a big stress case um the whole idea here is just to see how memory mapping on files works and I perform various um, file-based minmap operations and try and trigger kernel faults with that. Using the deprecated remap system call, I've added a page move stressor. Um, you know, I haven't seen any bugs with that, but it's just useful to exercise remap. And finally, I've added a VMA stressor, which exercises the virtual memory address space um, with, again, lots of different mixes of memory map operations. So. General kind of memory stressing, nothing, nothing too complex, but it's just ex it's good to exercise page handling, uh, faulting, and various minmap operations. Now for the processor, I've added a few more cache stresses. Um, I've got a cache line stressor which will fire off multiple press processes which share the same memory and form cache line. Um, validation check so it will basically populate different parts of of the cache and invalidate and so forth and move data around just to try and hammer the cache line to force any cache issues out i've added a far branch stressor this one creates tens of thousands of very small functions which basically just do a return and it's populated through multiple pages mapped in various regions in memory and the whole idea here is to actually map them um, as much as I can right across the whole memory space. So we have to do very long branching. And this this is kind of interesting to see how things perform well with um, long branching on various processes. 
Uh, the flash cache stressor is a very simple stress case which basically um, alters the alters the instruction or oh, alters instructions in executable text segments and also alters data and performs i cache and decache flushing if the processor allows this. Uh, this is useful because it actually makes the processor run really hot when you're exercising the caches and it's run this for hours on a small processor with a heat sink and hopefully you'll start to see various errors occur so uh it's a very simple stress case and finally um the llc affinity test basically exercises the whole level three or lower level cache and it changes cpu affinity so there's lots of activity going on between processes and a shared buffer which um, is being modified by these processes which jump CPU affinity. Um, this is kind of useful to see how things work on, say, large NUMA systems or systems with large cache with multiple processes. Um, scheduling is very useful to exercise, uh, especially because um, I've been looking at the real-time kernel and it's useful to kind of fresh out bugs with um, real-time locking and scheduling. So uh, I've added various stress cases for this. One in particular to note is the, is the priority inversion stressor. And this performs thread priority inversion using three threads. And um, it, it works well on RT kernels, but it's useful just to catch any regressions. We have also uh, standard ICC mutex stressing, um, racy scheduling. This basically sets up um, a whole bunch of processes which change CPU affinity and we just try and see if the scheduler can handle that. It's nothing complex, but it's useful to catch any issues there. Um, I've got a time warp stressor, which just checks if the time warps. I, I haven't seen any of those problems, but it's it's apparently an issue on some machines. The workload stressor is especially complex. This allows you to speci uh, specify various heavy loads, which could be worked um, across multiple processes. And you can specify the amount of time being run by each stressor and how long it relaxes and various work patterns to see basically how the scheduler handles not just continuous running of processes, but processes which start, stop, wait, and have bursty activity. So that's kind of useful with large SMP systems just to see if the scheduler is working efficiently. Um, other ones like the min nano sleep. This is just basically uh, measures the nano sleep with different schedulers. It's not that diff not that complex, but it's just nice to see how schedulers work with small sleeps. The new version, the latest versions of Stress and G now add a full set of signal handling. So the final three I had to add in the last couple of years were SIG bus handling, XCPU, and XFS size signals. Um, these are just very simple stressors which set up different use cases to try and trigger these um, signals and catch them and see if they're working correctly. And for the SIG nest stressor, I've now got 25 nested signals which are hand handled at random. And let's just make sure that we can handle lots of signals being, um, being triggered inside signals and handling and nesting of that and making sure we don't fall off the end of the stack. So nothing complex, just my simple signal handling stresses there. Um, okay, how are we doing for time? Because I know we're well, half past, got 15 minutes. So processes um, work in different ways. So I've added um, for various architectures, ways of triggering privileged instructions from the non-privileged user space, just to see how those are being trapped and if the kernel handles those correctly. I've added a reg stressor, which basically does register copying of data. Nothing very complicated there, but it makes sure that it works correctly and no, no data is being lost or corrupted. For CPUs, which allow you to do waits and pauses from user space to drop the processor into low power states, such as ARM, x86, PowerPC, and RISC-5 and Long64, I've added um, a wait CPU stressor to exercise these opcodes. And these are kind of useful just to make sure um, these opcodes are being handled correctly and they're not causing any issues. 
And for x86, I've added a CPU ID stressor, which basically puts in lots of random CPU ID instruction mixes just to see if that causes any particular hangs on large systems. Well, thank you so much for holding on with me so far. We're nearly at the end of this part. So uh, I've also added more system call and kernel interface coverage. I've added a very simple C group V2 exercise, which performs mounts, reads and writes and unmounts, just to make sure that C groups are working correctly. Uh, a DFT fork stressor performs file descriptive copying, just using fork. Nothing complex there, just make sure that FD's file descriptors have been copied correctly across forks. Uh, the, the F size stressor checks um, for 32 bit and 64 bit file size limits, make sure those are working correctly and we don't get wraparound. The Metabix stressor is useful. This creates um, lots of file access and alters the metadata, things like the dates, you know, the timestamp, and so forth, and tries to make sure. Well, tries to trip race conditions and has a bit of sanity checking there to see if metadata is updated correctly or if it gets out of sync. Uh, Linux 610 adds the memseal system call, so I've added a test for that. Um, it's quite a small test at the moment. It needs to be kind of bulked up a bit more, but I need to actually uh, get a bit more time to add more functionality to that stress test. I've added a syscall stressor, which exercises as many of the Linux system calls as possible. So for each system call, I've got a little handler which tries to exercise it in various different ways to cause problems and exercise it legitimately and with incorrect parameters. Uh, I've added a U-mount stressor, which creates racy file system um, you know, U-mounts, and an unlink stressor, which basically tries to unlink files in a very racy way. So it creates lots of files and unlinks them across multiple processes just to see if unlink fails. And if you run this on various file systems, you'll see that the behavior is um, sane or not on those file systems. So that's basically a rundown of like 50 changes or 50 new stress cases. Thank you for bearing with me. It was a whistle stop tour. And um, if you want to learn more about those, you can refer to the documentation. Each stressor is fairly well documented. And uh, if you want to ask further questions, drop me a line if you're not sure how things work. So what pushes stress and G development? What's the kind of focus and how does it work? Well, I continually monitor um, new features in the kernel. I'm always looking out for the new system calls, IOCTOR commands, uh, SysFS and ProcFS entries and particular devices to add stress cases for those. I also run uh, every month or so uh, GCUB coverage. So this is where I have the kernel. I try and get the latest kernel, enable GCUB coverage on that. I run stress NG across uh, on the new kernel with a, there's a test script called kernel. Um, oh, I've forgotten what it's called. It's not bad. Anyway, I've got, I've got a, 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 a test script in the stress and G repository, which will exercise every, lots of different stress cases. Uh, and it runs for about 12 or 15 hours, depending on your machine. And at the end, GCOV pops out um, coverage information and useful HTML document, which you can then look at to see how each part of the kernel has been exercised. And where I see holes in functionality or new functionality added, and I haven't got tests for that, I try and add more tests. But this is a never ending task and it's really slow, painful progress on that. I also look at new processor features. So if you've seen already, I've added vector and AI opcodes. And with the AI space increasing and changing and evolving, I'm trying to add more AI functionality into Stress and G given the time. But if anyone wants to contribute, that would be really useful. I also look for new architectures which are supported. For example, if Debian brings new architecture online, I try and get strategy up and running on that using um, hardware, if I can get hardware or an emulator. Uh, I also look at uh, reproducers listed in the kernel log and implement some of those reproducers so we can uh, catch any regressions on bugs where there's been an issue that's been fixed in the kernel and maybe later on it regresses again. So I try and add tests like that into StressNG. And 
I get from the uh, GitHub stress and G repository people file bugs and say, can you put cover? Uh, can you put stress cases for X, Y, and Z, or can you add extra functionality? And I'm very happy for people to suggest new stress cases, and I'm even happier when people actually provide contributions such as whole stresses or maybe just more enhancements to existing stress cases. So contributions are always welcome, and I really appreciate that. So that's where we are now. Where are we going from now on? Well, I'm adding at the moment as we speak a new sync start option. This will allow all the stresses to start up so they get forked or spawn, they get ready to run, and when they're all ready and ready to run, they will then start in synchronization. So this is useful if you want to, say, run like 500 stresses on a 500 node machine. You can use sync start, they all fork, they'll all get ready, and when they're all ready to run, they suddenly hit the machine at once. The normal start up is to basically start a stressor and start running and it takes a while to start all the stressors up so we get this kind of slow cascade of stressors building up but the sync start allows you to basically get ready and then run everything simultaneously so but this is a uh, in progress i've been working on this now for a week or so and i'm nearly there i'll probably get some commits at the end of the week for that change I'm also working on expanding the libc and libm coverage. Um, for example, OpenPSD, I found a syncos sigsegv bug with the coverage there with, when I was exercising that. So it's been useful already, but I had to hope to add more coverage onto that as time progresses. I also want to add power measurements. So when you want a stressor, it's really useful to see how much a uh, processor is being, um, how much power a processor is using. So I'm going to add um, support for x86 using REPL, but um, I want to make this uh, portable in the long term. But for now, x86 is is my first initial cut for this. My aim for Stress and G is to do a monthly release. Normally it's the beginning of each month. So if you find bugs or you know, there are issues, report them, and hopefully I'll get those fixed and released for the next month. My, my aim is to make it release often, release with lots of fixes when they're found, and also make um, Stress and G as portable as possible and make sure it runs across a load of architectures. So very quickly, um, when I do a release, I run Stress and G on various operating systems, Linux, BSD, various Unix systems, Minix, um, Apple OS X, Herd, and HiOQ. Um, and I run it on lots of different architectures. Uh, we've also seven different compilers. So I try and exercise stress and G as much as I can across a whole range of systems on a whole load of architectures just to make sure it builds correctly and it runs through um, the lightweight tests and doesn't hang or lock up because of bugs and stress and G. Now bugs do get through and I try and fix those quickly, but I use over 100 virtual machines, so that kind of catches most issues. But as you can appreciate, it takes a while to get stressing out every month. It's typically two to three days of compute across 100 virtual machines. So I try and make sure the code's tested well before I do a release. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I do um, stress and G kernel coverage testing. I've got at the bottom here, I've got a track of all the different versions of stress and G. Um, this blue line here represents, this vertical blue line represents um, two years ago. So you see the kernel coverage has increased from about 30,000 functions to about 35,000 functions. It's kind of petering out now. I'm, it's really hard to find, get more kernel coverage because it's, it's really hard to tickle lots of bits of code in the kernel without writing more and more tests. But as you can see, you know, we're, we're a slowly upward um, in, in getting our coverage. And development wise, things have started to pick up kind of exponentially. In the last two years, we've had four and a half thousand commits. We've got 45 new commit authors. So basically we doubled the number of people working on stress and T with supplying patches. We've added 50 more stressors, 55,000 new lines of code, and I've made 32 releases. So, you know, busy, fast development, 
released often, released monthly, and improve functionality all the time. That's the main concept. If you want to find out more, there's a manual which goes to stress and tea. So get hold of the software, clone it, type make PDF, and it produces a PDF of the manual. There's about well over 100 pages now. Um, there's nearly a thousand options altogether. So it's a lot of a lot of options, a lot of controllability. But my aim in the future is to write a quick start manual page. Um, there's a quick reference guide on wiki.ubuntu.com if you want to just get started really quickly. But I am aiming to add, uh, write more documentation just to help people who are new starters to stress and G because with all these stress cases, it can be very overwhelming. Okay, so that's about it. Um, if you want to go to the project, there's a GitHub um, reference up there. You can send email to my uh, my Gmail account. I'm open, you know, 24-7, send me an email and I try and reply within 24 hours. And any requests or bug fixes, I try and get around to those within 48 hours. So I try to be responsive and I try to be helpful. Um, community's great. People these last couple of years have really been embracing stress and G and giving me lots of really positive feedback and um, reporting bugs really well and helping me out with the bug fixing um, and release cycle. So, you know, stress and G is upwardly going and community has been really helpful. So that's about it. Thank you very much. That was a really quick zip through everything <laughs> in the last few years has changed and I hope that's been useful. Yeah, it very much has. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, it's amazing how much things have changed actually over the last year. I think that's really cool. One of the things we're looking at um, in the Elisa project right now is starting to surface out the requirements and the requirement traceability. And a lot of what you've got as test is tests of effectively requirements. So I was wondering, did you have any thoughts on how you would like to see requirements formally expressed and then how we could do a linkage to some of your tests in Stress NG? Um, this is interesting because uh, formal, formally specifying them is um, something which I don't really work for. If I'm, I'm, I, I normally have people just reach me out of band and say, oh, I'd like to exercise. Yeah, no, I, I know, but we, we should be able to reverse engineer and create these requirements to match up to some of the tests at least. Yeah, so I, I think any requirements really, if they're written out in a way which I can understand and comprehend in plain <laughs> English, with, with maybe examples of how you want things tested, then yeah, you know, that's <laughs> that's probably a way forward. Um, okay. If you make it too formal, I think we can end up, you know, spending a lot of effort yeah. making it over formalizing. Where you know we, you know, we 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 can ping pong messages back and forth. So um, yeah, no, I I think the 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 challenge is going to be um, having it formal enough that people in the safety space mm -hmm. can understand it, and then okay. it can and then and then they know if they care about this feature. For their safety case, they know which stress NG tests to be running to do make right. sure there's no regression. That's kind of the vision here. Okay. So I can't provide any recommendation what to do. I think I think that okay. if, if someone produces a formal specification of what needs to be tested, I'm very happy to be to look at oh. that. And then and then we can you know iterate round and so I can actually I try and understand it. I think I think that's probably the best way forward. So yeah, I'm just trying to we're just trying to figure out where to actually put these requirements in a way that we can refer to them down the road. Okay. Because you know, um, the documentation doesn't express things that way. They're talking about subsystems, and so it's a putting a level of system engineering that has been missing up till now. And so the question is, but I'm I'm thinking that a lot of what you've got already in stress and G is going to be part of the tests of some of these requirements. They've just been implicit as opposed to explicit up till now. Okay. And so, like we've been working on, um, there's a tool called Basil that Red Hat's just open sourced. Um, and so that's starting to track requirements. And so starting to figure out how we can express these requirements and then linking them to some of these tests and stress and G seems like a, a path forward to definitely explore in my mind. Yeah, I think also um, like with the documentation, it's yeah, mm -hmm. it's useful as, as, as like, for example, as stress and G grows, you know, we, we could actually have like references. Like if you want to test this, you know, here's, a, here's the formal yeah. case, yeah. but here's how to test this with a stress and G. So, um, yeah. I, I'm very aware that the documentation on stress NG is is kind of sufficient for just about understanding what it does, but you know, it's really useful for <laughs> so, you to so, actually ground you know, it in practical cases. So if you have a, a test yeah, requirement. I'm just wondering so. if we can start to put, you know, into, you know, if we can start to 
almost put some of these the quote unquote requirement into your documentation to say, hey, if you care about this, this is how to test it and things like yeah. that. Yeah, things like that I'm, I'm very happy to have hyperlinks in the documentation. So when people read the man page, they can click on that and zip through. That's... Go on to that. Okay, no, that's yeah. cool. Um, no, I accept others... patches. If someone wants to take the documentation. <laughs> <laughs> Situation normal. Um, the other <laughs> question I had is, um, do you see any barrier for us trying to run stress ng on Zephyr? Because Zephyr is a POSIX OS now. Yeah, I I think someone should just get clone, type okay. make, and see what happens. Yeah. And if there are any problems, send me the build log failures, okay. or even give me access to a, a Zephyr system. <laughs> and I'm very happy to try and get that up and support it. So, okay, I mean, cool. it, it it's, essentially, it's just access to systems, which allows me to do that figure out why it's not working so sure. as i said most of my stuff's done in virtual machines so i already awesome. get access to lots of different hardware but i've got access to lots of different operating systems running vms so okay um yeah and so if anyone has any questions uh, feel free to unmute and or type them in the chat and we can relay them on there's oh, a question in chat um okay Shant, do you want to come off a mute and um to ask, I just allowed you to talk, so you're still muted. Okay, maybe he has trouble with audio, but his question is: Is stress ng can stress ng be used to stress GPU? Uh, and I think he meant discrete. GPU. Yes. Um, well, the um, GPU stressor already built in stress and G looks for a um, 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 for the DRM dev interface. So if there's that interface accessible, then the answer is yes. It depends what the kernel driver does. But I suggest using the GPU stressor just to see how that works because it's either going to work or it doesn't if it doesn't let me know and we can look at trying to expand the scope of that and and the actual gpu stress is quite naive it just basically renders um renders stuff on the gpu nothing really complex but it's just there to kind of ramp up you can ramp up multiple instances of it so it's 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 simple and naive and i don't want to do much more than that um, I don't want to have a full GPU stress test case because I think there are other systems out there which um, exercise GPUs really well, and that's not really in the scope of the project. So if you have a question, you can either type into the Q&A panel and we can take questions from there, or you want to type into chat. Uh, I can unmute you and you can talk. Don't, so far I don't okay. see questions in Q and A, but we can get people more time. Um, so Brian just finished putting something in the chat for the webinar. Um, Brian Bratloff saying, um, and asking if we have a Basil tracking test, does kernel CI run them? I don't think that's stress and G related, so I'm not sure. Hey, yeah, sorry. Um, it, it, so I know we're we're working on Basil to track tests and stress and G, um, but it, like kernel CI is kind of trying to test all this stuff. Is that kind of like the back end of running these stress and G tests? For Basil, I don't no. know how to answer okay. that. No. I, think, I, I think I think Brian, uh, stress and is a standalone set of scripts. It hasn't been linked into kernel CI. Correct. Um, yeah. So I, I use it to to stress like RT Linux right now. Um, okay. And uh, right now it's all manual testing. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was just trying to find a place to plug all this in. Um, mm -hmm. I yeah, think. So Eventually, possibly, you know, the one area to probably have, a, you know, to join in on the discussions is um, for the Basil stuff and trying to surface up the requirements to stress NG. Um, 
some of the tests from stress and G, I think we can start to look at exploring if we can get that to be happening effectively and then making sure that whatever requirements are there are sort of documented as well inside the stress and G. How we take these requirements and move them to kernel CI, I think is a really good question and we need to explore that further. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you. Um, you know, with um, with all these tools, um, it's a command line tool. So if it doesn't work in the way you anticipate when you run a test, and you have ideas of improving how you run, well, how you want to run stress and G within a, a test framework, let me know, and we can discuss ways for trying to improve it. So yeah, you know, I, I know stress and G has been used for lots of people in different stress env uh, test environments, but that's you know evolved over time as people pointed out different deficiencies or features they require. So I'm always up for, uh, you know, let me know and we can try and change things and improve it if, if there are problems. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much again. It's been really exciting to see all the progress you've made in the last year, a couple of years. There's all sorts of new things there. So very cool. Yeah, it's been a busy time. <laughs> and, yeah, um <laughs> and I've been recovering from long COVID. I've still got long COVID. So, um, oh my you gosh. Know, so, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> although I haven't been physically that great and active, uh, mentally, you know, I'm still working on 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 tools like this. So, uh, yeah, it's, the pace has been much faster over the last two years. Lots of uh, community buying is, is starting to happen. Um, I'm really pleased people are actually sending me patches and and being really active in in using the tool and letting me know where their problems. So um you know it's it's expanding and uh, and kind of accelerating so i'm i'm you know I'm, it's really exciting time for me to see how how tool is being used and as i say i'm very open to helping out whenever there are issues and and trying to improve the tool for folk yeah uh, matt kelly is uh working on the tooling group inside elisa right now and so he may mm. be in touch i suspect um okay. and so you can sort of hook up with some of the other tools and see if we can make things all interact together it'd be kind of cool down the road yeah, cool. That'd be really good. Okay, Excellent. well, thanks again for this opportunity to give everyone an update. Sorry, it's a kind of, you know, lots of details, lots of information. But... <laughs> no, that, that's very much welcome. And the fact that it's <laughs> Refer to the manual. We can, we can stuff. watch it again sl slower. <laughs> yeah, and if, and if you've got if you've got questions, just drop me an email. I, I try and respond quickly, so. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, then. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. And, yep. Yeah. Oh, there's one last question, sorry. Any oh, documentation yeah. available on how to contribute to Stress NG? Um, ah, so the different ways to contribute. Um, <laughs> I haven't actually written any way of like um how to write how to write changes or add stress tests. So that is very much lacking. Um, so yes, that's a very good question. Most folk who've supplied changes have looked at what other people have done with changes. So where a new stress test has been added, people have looked at the Git history and seen how a new stress test has been added. And you can see what needs to be plugged in to make a new test. But I must admit, there's, the documentation is is non-existent. So I will put that down as a to-do um, for the next few months to actually write some proper documentation on how to add stress tests, because yes, that's lacking. But if people want to, you know, I'm happy to work people to, to point them and write and, and you know give them notes on where how to start. Right. Can the stress tool is a question. Can it can the tool be used as a library? Um, I'm afraid it can't be. It's it's designed as a command line tool. Um, to be used as a library is just it's it's kind of our scope of the project. It's it's stress teaches us some very evil things in the back in the back of the code and to make it into a library will affect the way other things work so it's best to be on its own i'm afraid and, and not as a library but that's a good question thanks all right well 
Uh, with that, and Colin, I think you posted on the chat. There are quite a few thank you uh, for the talk, and uh, and we would like to thank you as well for contributing to Elisa by giving our Elisa community this uh, seminar talk. It's very informative, and we'll distribute the materials and uh, upload the recording to our YouTube channel. And uh, thanks again, and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Okay. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. Bye.